Hello to everyone who's joining us today. My name is Matthew Monagle and I am the web manager at Columbia Business School Executive Education. And today we are going to be speaking with uh, Professor McGrath. Um, I'll introduce her in just a moment, but before we get started, I wanted to take an opportunity and go through just a few housekeeping tips. If you've been on one of our webinars before, then um, you'll be familiar a bit with the format. If you have any questions as we uh, go through the webinar, you can use the Q&A box. It's located on the center of your screen to ask them. We would encourage you to ask them as you think of them so that we can circle around, but we don't want to miss anything that might come to mind as, as uh, Professor McGrath is presenting. We'll also have a full recording of this webinar available after the fact. We usually have those out to the participants in about two to three business days. And we'll be keeping an eye on your posts on social media as well. So if you want to talk about this webinar, feel free to do so at using the CBS exec ed hashtag. So it's my great privilege today to introduce Professor McGrath. Um, I think that she is one of those faculty members that doesn't need much in the way of introduction. She is a world renowned speaker. She is a faculty member here at Columbia Business School Executive Education. Um, she's a consultant for major corporations. And most importantly for our purposes, she teaches our leading strategic growth and change course. And she is going to be the faculty director of our upcoming Managing Corporate Entrepreneurship Program. It's an online program that we'll be launching in 2017 that we're really excited about. So Professor McGrath, welcome. Uh, thanks, Matt. Um, I should also mention we're going to be doing an event on January 10th, uh, which is gonna feature myself and Steve Blank. So if anyone's interested in getting information about that, please reach out to us and we'll see if we can get you on the uh, invitation list. It's sponsored uh, partly by our um, Corporate Entrepreneurship Center here at, at Columbia. So very exciting uh, development there. So our topic today is really how do you understand your customers? And I think it was Peter Drucker uh, many years ago who put this very well. Um, and I just love this quote. He said, the customer rarely buys what the business thinks it sells him. <laughs> and I think that's a good thing to remember uh, and to be quite humble about because a lot of times what we present to customers is just completely different than what, uh, what we think you know, that customers are really getting from us. And it's very easy to get these things wrong. Um, for example, <laughs> here's an example of a, a very badly failed line extension for the Jell-O company. They thought there would be this fantastic market for mixed vegetable flavored Jell-O for salads. That sounds like a good one. Um, or what we find is that we have our own preconceived notions about who customers are. In fact, I was working with a very famous retailer based in the UK who said, oh, you know, customers just don't behave the way they're supposed to. I've got grannies in here with their iPads and iPhones researching things, uh, and grannies aren't supposed to be technologically astute. And yet, you know, that's really not very uh, interesting when it comes to, well, let's under, they are doing that, so let's make sure that we can understand how they are actually uh, behaving. So I think the first problem with looking at customers in a very insightful way has to do with how we think of them in terms of segments. And so you've just seen an example of what can happen when customers don't fit into the segmentation schemes that we've designed for them. And the basic problem with where most segmentation starts is that it starts with attributes or characteristics of the individuals that we're trying to sell to. So things like their age, their gender, how much money they make, uh, and so forth. And the problem with all of those things is they tell you a lot about sort of what their characteristics are, but they don't really tell you very much about why they buy, what are the needs that are being filled, or in the words of Clay Christensen, what's the job that they're trying to get done as they're doing business with you. So we really need to be thinking about segments to me in a very different way. We want to be thinking about the customer's behavior, or as Clay's talked about a lot, the job that they have to be done. And so to illustrate this, I'd like to use the example of an elevator company that I worked with. And the business model in elevators historically has been that you really competed very, very hard for getting a new elevator installed. And then you would have 20 to 30 or even longer years of maintenance revenue that would come after that. And for a long time in that industry, the 
business model really held. People didn't maintain each other's elevators. The person that built the elevator generally got to maintain it. And that started to break down, um, you know, after the turn of the last century. And my client was very interested in changing their model completely. And they said, you know, rather than just compete on new elevators, what we want to do is compete to be the provider of choice who's going to give the lifetime value of the elevator to the elevator's owners. And so they said, well, maybe we need to understand something about the elevator's owners, right? And so they went and they looked at um, who owned elevators. And it turns out you could own a low-rise elevator, um, and, or you could own a uh, mid-rise elevator, or surprise, surprise, you could own a, you know, part of an elevator that was in a mega project, so an airport or a, or a, a big uh, train station, for example. And the reason that this was the dominant segmentation form in that industry was that this described the technology used to deliver the service. So it was a different technology for these different product categories, and that's how they organized themselves. So here's a really practical thing I would take away from this webinar right now is try not to segment, you know, try not to put customers in categories that are driven by how you operate because it's not going to tell you very much about the customer. To understand about the customer, what you need to do is operate the way that they think. And so we, um, we said, well, let's go out and actually talk to some customers and do some interviews and do some observing of how they think about their elevators. And what we found was absolutely fascinating. We found three product behavior segments that cut across the product sort of technology segments. So the first segment um, was one that had a very different job to be done than, uh, than the others. And they were what we called the take care customer. These were people who basically wanted nothing from the elevator company except good, consistent service. If I have a problem, I want it uh, to be fixed. But otherwise, I just want you to take care of it for me. Leave me alone. I don't want to spend one minute of energy or, or a bit of a, you know effort to interact with you. So it was ridiculous. You know, beautiful brochures that went straight in the trash, salespeople who were being, you know, incented to call on these guys regularly, getting the door slammed in their face. It was just a very different uh, kind of behavior. And what was interesting was we found that behavior went across all three of the product segments. Now, the second kind of job that wanted to be done was a kind of customer that we came to call the show-off customer. Now, show-off customers are completely different than take-care customers. Show-off customers want the latest brochure. They want, they greet your salespeople with open arms. You know, they, they say, oh, you know, if it's springtime, can we make the elevator smell like lilacs or whatever? Um, and, you know, again, a very different kind of behavior, right, than the, than the take-care people want. And then the third category was um, organizations that owned many, many elevators. So you can think of them as, you know, a big hotel chain or a, a line of manufacturing that has elevators in their buildings all across the world. And because they're so large, they have their own uh, engineering staffs, right? So the take the hard we came to call these the hardcore because they had top top engineering talent and very technically astute, right? So they, they their position was you know don't bother sending me your brochures send me your blueprints, <laughs> right? We can read them. Um, our technical people and their technical people like to go out to lunch together and talk about things like fluid viscosity and its effect on lift propensity that kind of thing. Um, now what became very interesting and what was a huge insight for the company was that all three of these segments could be very attractive to serve, but they were looking for a very different kind of um, service from the players. So the hardcore people we really invested in to, to learn, right? And out of that was where a lot of the innovations came that were useful for the show-off customers. And out of that, some of the innovations were also really helpful in the take care segment. And what's great about the take care people is, you know, you have to really go out of your way to infuriate them before they'll switch to another supplier. They're very, very reluctant to switch. So if your costs go down, they don't know, right? Um, and so you can kind of just keep offering them the same service, even if you've been able to improve your internal efficiencies and so forth. So it's just an example of a really different way of thinking about customers, not so much in terms of who they are, you know, are they big, are they small, are they whatever, but what do they need to get done and how do they feel about what they need to get done?
And so the strategy really follows those customer jobs. So for the take care, it's, you know, core, basic, good service, uh, no frills, right? For the, for the show off customers, it's lots of differentiation. And for the hardcore customer, it's genuine, you know, on the ground innovation. And we ended up um, actually running that strategy through the whole corporate company that was beginning probably about 10 years ago. And today, this company has evolved its strategy. And what they're talking about today is maximizing the flow of people and goods throughout your building. So they've expanded just from thinking about the elevator to thinking about the elevator owner's complete job, complete problem to be done, and maximizing the way that these assets can be used to help them do their jobs. So the jobs to be done idea, which is in a very, it's actually funny because there's this huge academic spat going on between uh, Clayton Christensen and a guy named Tony Ulwick, both of whom claim paternity of this particular idea. Um, and so Tony's got a book out called, uh, I think it's called The Job to Be Done, and Clayton's got a book out called um, uh, competing against luck. They're both good books. They're both good guys. I personally don't mind who you learn from, but the essence of it is you really want to understand the customer's situation. What is it that they want to get done? And what's the outcome that they're trying to drive? Now, if you look at this um, this way, one of the things that quickly becomes clear is that your competitor is actually not necessarily others in your industry, but it's other ways that job could get done right? And I think that's a very important point to think about when you're trying to really understand who that customer is that you're trying to reach. So when you think about a customer job to be done, I think it's very useful to think in terms of verbs rather than nouns. This is a point that my colleague Adam Royalty makes. So if you think about a child's soccer ball getting you know, kicked up into a tree and you say, well, what does this child need? A lot of us would come back and say, oh, a ladder or, oh, they need a you know, particular, a long stick to poke this thing. And that's thinking of these needs in terms of nouns. But if you were instead to think of this need in terms of what, what it is the child needs to be able to do, it becomes a verb. And the verb might be something like to reach, this child needs to reach. Now, if you think about reaching, right, you could have a vastly expanded set of things that you could be thinking about. So you might, you might indeed have a pole that would be the solution or a, a fire hose that could blow the ball out of the uh, uh, air or whatever. Um, so I think it's just useful to be training yourself to always don't just jump to what you think the solution is, jump to what you think the, the need is expressed in verbs, as in I need to be able to do something like that. Um, now, you know, in many cases, your offering is probably not what you think. And I, I want to just share the story of a friend of mine who goes on a lot of business trips. And so she do, does work with a lot of limousine companies, and they take her to and from the airport and so forth. Um, and the first limo company was a very traditional firm. And they were great in terms of, you know, most of the time they were great. But, you know, she had to call them up verbally. They didn't have any kind of automated system. They didn't have an app for tracking rides or anything like that. And the worst part of it all was she would come back from these business trips and she'd have a whole stack of, of you know, bills to be paid and receipts to be paid and clients to be billed. And she couldn't um, submit her invoices until she'd gotten all the receipts. And this particular limo company was very bad at sending her receipts. Like the driver didn't have it in the car, so she'd have to call up, they fax it to her. Um, and it was a big pain in the neck because, you know, she needed those receipts in order to get all these other things done that she had to. So she ended up, with regret, switching from these guys who were very nice but just didn't have much going for them. And she switched to another company where their model was, indeed, you would book online. But the other thing that they did was they, they, they would not actually show up to pick her up. You had to make a phone call at the other end. Um, and they would, they would, and she'd have to wait, you know, 15 or 20 minutes uh, to, get, to get the driver to meet up with her. And that was kind of over time kind of a pain too. And then finally, the third company, and the one she does business with now, is a company where everything's online. Um, you get a reminder email a day or two before your ride is supposed to happen. You get a text when the driver's on site. Um, the driver tells you exactly where he is, and the invoice is automatically generated at the end of the trip, and it's sent to you automatically by email. Now, the point that I want to make is, I mean, and this is a person who, for a limo company, she probably generates, I don't know, 
five to ten thousand dollars worth of business in a given year just because of how much she travels so here are these three different limo companies and each of them did a perfectly acceptable job of getting her from point a to point b so the point I want to make is that the reason that third company got her business was they really attended to the whole experience. They didn't just do the point A to point B thing. They said, you know, we really need to understand and deal with all these other jobs that this person has to get done. Now, the thing I think is particularly interesting about this story is those first two companies probably have absolutely no idea why she changed her business, why she changed her provider, and none of them even asked. I asked her about that. I said, well, did they call you up and say, hey, we haven't seen you in a while. What's going on? And she said, no, they never did. So they're completely clueless as to what is actually the motivator for her wanting to um, use one company over another. So I think that's an important example to remember because, you know, what, again, what we're selling customers is not necessarily what they are really buying. So a tool that I use to get at some of these jobs to be done and that we'll be exploring in the course is something called a consumption chain. And just as with the limo companies, it's not just the using, right? It's not just the doing of the job. It's all these other things that a customer goes through as they're in the context of doing business with you. So there's awareness, right? They're searching for some kind of solution. There's picking a provider, signing an agreement, getting financing, and so forth and so forth all the way through. And um, what I think is interesting is that very often the aspect of this that makes a competitive difference is not actually the main functionality of what you think you're buying. So to go back to my limo company example, why has Uber been so successful at supplanting local taxi companies and uh, limo companies? Well, partly it's because they've gotten rid of a lot of the friction of arranging for that service. You know, you you find a, a resource online, that you pay for it. Uh, it's all hooked up to a credit card. It's, it's pretty seamless. And it's not that they're better drivers, right? It's not that their cars are that much different. It's that they're working on the rest of the experience. And I think that's just something we should all bear in mind. So here's a workshop that you could do back home. Um, and we will, as, as Matt said, be making a recording of this uh, webinar available to you. So try it. Uh, select a customer segment. And we'll give you some prompts that discuss how that segment moves through their experiences. And then what you could do to better help them get their jobs done. And remember uh, verbs. So I'm going to encourage you to be a bit of a detective here. Pick a few links. And this is just a guide to some of the links that you might want to be looking at and then start asking these questions, right? What really keeps your customers up at night? Are there solutions they may not be aware of? Can you increase awareness? Uh, maybe you can shorten the time from perception to uh, action. And I think just as you as you work your way through these, what will often happen, and happens to me all the time when I work with companies, is they'll say, oh my god, I had no idea. I didn't know how to answer these questions at all. Um, and it really forces you to get out of the building, go do some talking, listening, and observing, and really look at how customers are behaving with respect to the aspects of your offer that may relate to uh, them. So another great example, and I'll, I'll finish up here, and then we'll have time for some questions. So be thinking of your questions. Uh, some of you will be familiar with the Dollar Shave Club. Uh, and so this entrepreneur that started this thing recognized that for many men, the way that razors uh, get sold in the United States is kind of a pain in the neck. Uh, because they're expensive and uh, are easily stolen because they're small, a lot of stores that provide them lock them up behind uh, you know, glass. And so if you want to buy them, you have to actually go find someone in a retail store to unlock it for you, um, take out the blades and, and go pay for them. And they're expensive to boot. So this guy had an idea, which was, let's take uh, outsourced razors. You know, we're going to make them in Korea. They're reasonably high quality. And what we're going to do is have a subscription model where people, mostly men or women who are buying shavers from it, sign up. And then once a month, they get a delivery of as many razors as they think they would like uh, right to their doorstep on a regular basis. Now, what makes this particularly fun is, and, and I would encourage you to go look it up, um, they, they've got a very cool, like, just under two minute video which describes uh, their business concept and this thing went completely viral so they had something like 20,000 brand ambassadors tweeting this thing out and 
recommending it on Facebook and liking it and so forth. And the razors aren't better than the <laughs> competitors' razors, but the whole business model around them was better and for many men much more convenient. So another example of how you can build a competitive advantage without necessarily innovating around a particular product or technology. So uh, this and more in Mastering Corporate Entrepreneurship Online. Um, and uh, that's the link, but the link will also be in the Q&A box, Matt, as I understand it. And uh, we'll love to see you there. It's a, it's a seven-week course. Uh, it begins January 16th, I believe. And uh, we're mixing a blend of recorded sessions. So, you know, if you've had a bad day and you just want to <laughs> kick back and, and watch some videos, you can do that. But we're also doing some online uh, work. And the course is meant to be very practical and hands-on. It, uh, it allows you to do real project work with your teams if you want to. So with that much, I will conclude my formal remarks and see if we have any questions I can address. Hi, Rita. Thanks so much. Uh, that was a great presentation. And we do have a few questions that have come in, so I think we'll, uh, we'll jump right to them. One of the first questions I thought would be a good one for you to answer is people just want to know how to ask their customers if they are. You, you had a really good example earlier of your friend who'd never heard from the two companies, the two car companies, about their experience and what might have been missing. What are some ways for companies to start reaching out to those customers and, and um, pulling, getting the information on, on where they're falling short? Right. Well, so I think the first problem is very few companies have rigorous follow-up mechanisms. Um, you know, the ones that do tend to be consultancies, accountants, where there's a very formal kind of pitch process. And if they lose a pitch, they, they have an after-action review and they really, you know, get as much feedback as they can from the customer about why. And then they have an internal meeting to see how they could do better. But not very many companies in other sectors have that kind of rigorous review. So I think the first thing is recognizing when you've lost somebody, <laughs> you know, and then I think the second thing is, um, you know, people don't mind if, if, if giving you feedback, if you call and say, um, you know, we noticed you haven't done business with us. So we're wondering if there's anything we could do to change or improve or if you're using somebody else, what made you switch? I think the other thing that I think happens sometimes is there's almost like this emotional embarrassment about it, which is, oh, you know, I'm going to be asking for feedback and that might be awkward. And, and so people kind of have an emotional reluctance to doing it. But if you think about it, what could be better for your learning than having somebody who at one point was a loyal customer and no longer is tell you what's going on could be hugely valuable, even if it's a little painful in the moment. In the course, the Mastering Online course, we actually have a whole uh, series of video segments on how to conduct a customer interview and some examples that we show about, you know, the thing you have to remember is customers a lot of times are not really aware of why they're acting a certain way. Like in the case of the limo company, she was certainly aware because it was a real problem for her that caused her to switch. But in a lot of other cases, customers will tell you what you think they want to hear or they'll lie to you. <laughs> you know? um, and so you need to be you need to be kind of a little attuned to really watching what they're doing rather than just listening to what they say. So we had a, another person to ask um, kind of along those lines, if you are successful at listening to your customers and you are able to come up with some solutions um, for some of the problems you didn't even know they were having, how do you go about um, rolling that into your organization? How do you talk to, to your management or the people in your organization that um, may think that things are fine the way they are? And how do you get them to start addressing and, and implementing some of the changes you have in mind? Right, I think the best way is a demonstration of success. You know, when, when customers come back and say, oh, this was really helpful and, and useful to me and this is how I plan to use it. You know, when they hear it from customers, companies are often much more willing to change than if you're just one person in a field saying this is the way things should be. Uh, having a prototype, having a use case, having a couple of friendly beta testers give you feedback, those are all ways that you can start to bring that uh, terminology into your organization. Um, beyond that, I think you need to be a champion, you know, and, and build allies, figure out who else in your organization or in your customer's organization would benefit from uh, this change that you're going to provoke happening and get them involved, get them to help. Uh, and that can sometimes create a groundswell of support for something that you might want to do. Now we had someone else um, ask, kind of as a very, very top level, uh, how do you even begin the process of segmenting? I know you talked about some of the exercises you'll introduce during the program, but you know, if they if they want to start thinking about 
um, segmenting their current customers if it's something they've never done before in the organization. Um, do you have some places they could go to start thinking about it, some articles they could read, some suggestions for those first steps out of the gate? Sure. So I think the, a, a really easy place to start is with a recent edition of the Harvard Business Review in which uh, Clay Christensen summarizes his book, The Jobs to be Done book. Um, and that gives you a nice kind of way of starting to think about uh, framing the, the, the question. So I'd start there. The second thing I would start to do is look at when the predictions of your existing segmentation scheme don't seem to be very differentiated. And a, a good way of finding that is when there's as much variation within your segments as there is across them. So I'll go back to my example of the, the, the granny and the iPad, right? Um, if what you're saying is age is something I'm segmenting on, and yet within my age sector, there's as much variety in behavior as there is between different ages, so say grannies versus millennials, um, then you know that you've got a badly fitting um, segmentation model. And if that's happening, then you urgently need to go figure out what a different segmentation approach should be. And I've had a few people to ask about, um, you know, and in an the era of big data, how they kind of decide what information is worth listening to, I suppose. Um, do you have any advice or, or comments on that? You know, if they're awash in data, if they have the other problem, um, how they right. can go about deciding what is the pertinent information that they need to be listening to and what stuff they might be more comfortable ignoring. Sure. So anyone who's an expert on big data will tell you that it's just that. It's just it's just a, you know piles of ones and zeros. And the first thing you want to be really clear about in your mind is what is the question that you are trying to get an answer to. So I'll give an example from uh, Oded Netzer's section in the Managing Corporate Entrepreneurship course, and he used data from um, God, what's the auto site. People write in and uh, cars.com, I think. Is it cars.com? I think that I think that's his um, example. Or, or it was like a, like a place where there's a lot of chats. Anyway, he he followed social conversations on one of these cars sites, and what he was interested in studying was uh, over a period of time, Cadillac had really tried to change its positioning in the market to be from kind of a large American family type sedan, which is what it had become, to being much closer to Audi, BMW, you know, European luxury cars. And by using this data, um, he was able to group the way that people were talking about the different kinds of cars that were on this massive, massive car database. And what he was able to show was if you sort of took time slices at each year from this database, that you could um, actually see the movement of conversation around Cadillac with these people who are just car fanatics, uh, that it actually did move. It actually did have the impact of moving Cadillac in the conversation much closer to, say, an Audi than it was with the other American cars. So that's an example of you got a very carefully defined question, so has our investment in repositioning the brand paid off, to a data set that you can use some of these uh, techniques to really search. Um, and then you can you know, get an answer which shows you how people are talking about your brand, for example. I believe Oded also did an, a webinar, which I think is for, available for free on our website on this exact topic. Yeah, I believe we do have that in the archive as well. Um, and you should have that link, I believe, in one of the Q&A uh, questions I answered with that link there. Um, Rita, I think that's just about all the time that we have for t today. I want to thank everyone. We're having such fun. Man. I know, I know. I'm sorry. I always, this is the least favorite part of any webinar is the time where I have to come in and cut it all off. Um, but I want to say thank you so much. I know we had a lot of questions that we didn't have a chance to get to. Um, we're going to make sure that we forward all of those to uh, Professor McGrath. And if you follow her on social media or if you sign up for her newsletter, you might know that those questions have a way of getting answered in the most unlikely places. So <laughs> the things that you're thinking of, I guarantee you are going to be the things that the reader will be thinking of as well. And you might, uh, you might see those soon. In the ch you should see in the chat box as well, I posted that direct link to the Managing Corporate Entrepreneurship Online program page. Um, and we'd also ask if you take a few moments after this uh, webinar is concluded and fill out the survey. The uh, Zoom will redirect you to a brief survey. Just take a few seconds and uh, give us a little bit of feedback on the format and the content. We'd love to hear from you. Finally, one last thing, we will have a full webinar recording of this available. Um, again, that'll go up in about two to three business days, but be sure to keep an eye out on your email and on our social media channels. We'll make sure to let everyone know when that's out. But Rita, I just want to say thank you so much for a really engaging half an hour today. It was a pleasure to have you. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, everyone.